ClojureScript makes little attempt to hide the JavaScript underneath, but instead uses the host platform to its advantage. What that means is that you still have JavaScript's existing functionality and its pre-existing libraries at your fingertips. If you're already proficient in JavaScript, then you should learn early on how to map JavaScript code to the equivalent ClojureScript, so you can transfer your existing knowledge. That's what you'll learn in this episode. We'll start out simple with some strings. ClojureScript strings are just JavaScript strings. This means they have methods such as to uppercase and properties such as length. To call a method on an object, put a dot before the method name. In ClojureScript, the function always comes first, and the same is true for methods. To retrieve a property of an object, add a dash after the dot. Otherwise, ClojureScript will assume the property is bound to a function and try to call it. You can chain a sequence of method calls and property lookups by using the double dot operator. It's a bit like the thread first macro, except that now you can omit the dot before each method or property name. Suppose we have this line of JavaScript. Normally, we would have to turn that inside out and write something like this. But with this dot dot macro, it's much closer to the original. Notice that the dots before each method name are gone now. In fact, since this last method doesn't take any arguments, we can omit those parentheses as well. You can also use this dot dot to chain property access. The dots are gone, but you still need to dash. Notice that here I needed to access the global document variable. ClojureScript provides the special JS namespace, which contains all JavaScript globals. To do a JavaScript assignment, you can use this setBank function. We could use it to create a new global variable. But more commonly, you'll use it to assign properties. To do that, take the expression that would look up the property you want to assign and use that in setBang. This previous code will translate directly into a JavaScript assignment of the property using dot notation. But objects and arrays can also be accessed with square brackets. To achieve the same in ClojureScript, we have two sibling functions to our disposal, aget and aset. Here's the equivalent ClojureScript code. I'm also introducing two more functions, one to create a JavaScript array and the other one to construct a JavaScript object. We'll see more ways to create these JavaScript collections in a bit. A good thing to know is that when using this JS namespace to look up globals, it's possible to chain property access directly onto it, a bit like how you would in JavaScript. If the resulting value is a function, we can call it just like a ClojureScript function by wrapping it in parens. Besides simply calling a function, it's also possible to invoke it as a constructor to create a new object. In JavaScript, you do that with the new keyword. The ClojureScript equivalent is putting a dot after the function name. We can demonstrate this with the built-in date function. When called as a regular function, it returns a formatted string, but when called as a constructor, it returns a date object. So far, so good. You've learned how to call into JavaScript, and you've also figured out that a ClojureScript function is really just a JavaScript function. So you grab your favorite library and pass it an object with some configuration and a callback. You try it out and nothing happens. If you've been paying attention so far, you probably already realized that jQuery was expecting a JavaScript object, but we passed it a ClojureScript map. That's easy to fix. We'll use the jsopt function. There's a gotcha here, though. We also have to replace the keywords with strings. 
or closure script will generate a JavaScript object where the keys are prefixed with a colon. Now let's take a step back. How come this doesn't work with a closure script map? The thing is that even though they look similar, they're actually very different things. ClojureScript piggybacks on JavaScript and uses its strings, numbers, regular expressions and functions as is. But vectors and maps are not the same as or compatible with arrays and objects. This is not an oversight. ClojureScript offers immutable persistent data structures. These are state-of-the-art functional data types, which are much more suitable for the style of coding that is typical in ClojureScript. So we rewrote our AJAX call to use the JSOps function, and that certainly works. But there's an even simpler solution. Put hashtag JS before the map, and ClojureScript reads it as a JavaScript object. It works with arrays as well. Be aware that hashtag JS only affects the outer level, so any nested maps or vectors will not be converted. To convert nested structures, you can use CLJ arrow JS, and you can convert back as well with JS arrow CLJ. In JavaScript, object keys are always strings, so when converting back, they'll still be strings. But JS arrow CLJ will convert to keywords if you ask it nicely. When writing callbacks or event handlers, you often need to reference the current object scope with this. This is not a regular variable. It's a JavaScript keyword that does not exist in ClojureScript. For the cases where you do need it, there's the thisS macro, which lets you temporarily bind it to a certain name. In this example, I'm using the DOM API to add a button to the page. Each time you click the button, the number on the button increases. While the handler executes, this is bound to the DOM node that represents the button. So we bind that to B and check what number it has and then update it. This episode has been a bit encyclopedic. Thank you for sticking with me until the end. In general, I prefer to show you how to actually build stuff using more real-world examples. But I wanted to get this out of the way first. So when I use interop forms in the coming episodes, it won't come as a surprise. I've also found that sometimes people come from a JavaScript background, but still only learn this interop stuff quite late, or only bit by bit, making them feel restricted. If this is you, then I hope this episode has been empowering. There is a handy tool for trying out ClojureScript in your browser called Clips. The great thing about it is it also shows you how your code compiles to JavaScript. I recommend playing around with that. I'll add a link in the show notes. In the next episode on ClojureScript, I'll be using these, these interop forms to actually build something fun and interesting. In the meanwhile, if you have any feedback on this episode, please send it to arna at lambdaisland.com.